Hello and welcome to another live broadcast with MedStar Health. My name is Michelle Carter and today we're going to be talking about breast cancer risk factors, warning signs, treatment options, and much more. So stick around, share this broadcast with your friends, give us a like to let us know that you're watching and if you have any questions along the way, please post those in the comments below. Today I'm joined by four of our MedStar Health experts, breast surgeon, Dr. Atsuko Okabe, medical oncologist, Dr. Shweta Kurian, certified genetic counselor, Emily Kaczynski, and physician assistant, Stephanie Johnson. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to get to know of, uh, our panel of experts. So um, Dr. Okabe, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background at MedStar Health? Hi, so I'm Atsuko Okabe. I'm a uh, breast surgeon with MedStar Franklin Square. So I have been at um, Franklin Square since uh, 2008, and I see patients at Franklin Square as well as at the, our Bel Air location. Thank you, uh, Dr. Okabe. Uh, Dr. Kurian. Hi, I um, am Shota Kurian. I am a medical oncologist, um, and I'm all I'm. I am the director of the breast medical oncology program here at Franklin Square. Um, I see patients at both the Franklin Square location at the Bel Air location. Um, I've been with MedStar since 2015, uh, and um, you know it is um, it is a nice group of uh, people here who take care of breast cancer, um, and I feel privileged to be part of this team and being able to take care of my patients here. Thank you very much, doctor. Uh, Emily, I'll turn to you. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Emily Kaczynski. I'm a genetic counselor here at MedStar Franklin Square Medical Center. I've been here for a little over 10 years and I see patients for cancer risk assessment, genetic counseling, and testing related to inherited cancer syndromes and certainly um, with a focus on uh, breast cancer. And I agree with Dr. Perry and I'm um, privileged to be part of a great team. We really do um, bring all the specialties to the table and work together um, to come up with the best plan uh, for our patients. That's awesome. Thank you, Emily. Uh, Stephanie, I'll turn to you as well. Hi, my name is Stephanie Johnson. Uh, I've been a PA for about 26 years, but I've been with MedStar for about three years. I was diagnosed with breast cancer about seven years ago, and that steered me towards a career and shifting towards breast cancer. Um, I felt like I, I could really help ladies going through this since I'd been through it. Um, and I work mostly, uh, well, I work part-time both at um, Good Sam and in Bel Air, and I run the high-risk clinic at Good Sam. And it's a great group. That's good to hear. Thank you all. Thanks, Stephanie, for um, introducing yourself as well. And thank you all for taking the time out for this broadcast today. Uh, let's take some time to answer some of our questions. So first, um, I'll go to Dr. Kurian. What are the warning signs of warning signs or symptoms of breast cancer? So I think the commonest symptom most women will come with to us would be a lump in their breast that they have noticed. Though having said that, most of the lumps that people feel are not generally cancer. Um, and um, some people could present with a dimpling of the skin. They could present with a nipple discharge. They could present with pain. Uh, you could notice some swelling in the armpit or in the collarbone area. These are lymph nodes, which are associated with the breast that could be inflamed or enlarged. Um, there could be redness of the breast. Um, and these are some of the symptoms patient can present with uh, when they have breast cancer. But um, it is worthwhile to note that most women may have breast cancer growing in them and may have no symptoms from it at all. And that's why sometimes we always say the importance of screening and finding things early before you have symptoms, because by the time symptoms come, things may be much bigger, uh, much more advanced. So um, in order to understand what your breast, um, like a lump or how it feels, you need to be 
monitoring your breaths regularly, checking them once a month, so you know how it feels, and then you can figure out whether there is a lump or if there is a discharge or if there's something else that is going on. Thanks, Dr. Curian, for explaining that. Yeah, um, screenings are, an, er an early detection is very, very important. Um, Dr. Okabe, um, could you tell us how do you screen for breast cancer? So we consider um, mammography as the gold standard for breast screening. And that is definitely a um, huge uh, step in trying to identify breast cancers early. So if a woman has been getting regular mammography, uh, annually, then probably we're going to detect breast cancer even years before it might become a lump that can be felt. Um, fortunately, with mammograms, we've advanced to what we call uh, 3D or tomosynthesis. So um, it's almost like a CAT scan with a mammogram, and you get the, where the, the radiologist can kind of just panel through the breast in two directions and really helps with uh, detecting abnormalities, even with women who are younger and who have dense breast tissue. Um, at times, breast ultrasound may be indicated if there is a specific area of concern, then ultrasound is very good at further defining the abnormality. And then for our high risk patients, um, which I think we're gonna talk about that in a little bit, but women who have been identified as high risk may also uh, be indicated to have breast MRI as part of their annual screening in addition to mammograms. Thank you, Dr. Otabe. Um, at this time, I'd like to turn to uh, Stephanie Johnson. Uh, what are the screening guidelines for breast cancer? So the, guideline, the guidelines are um, guided through the NCCN, which is the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. And so there's guidelines for average risk, risk women from 25 to 40, and then there's guidelines for our increased or high risk patients. Uh, so generally speaking for our 25 to 40 year old average risk patients, um, seeing a, getting a clinical exam with your OBGYN or your PCP once a year um, or every other year, breast awareness as um, Dr. Curian has mentioned, uh, and then the American College of Radiology recommends actually a um, starting risk assessment um, and risk stratification at the age of 25, which can be done through a computer model called the Tyrecusic model. And that's T-Y-R-E-R-C-U-Z-I-C-K. And uh, women can actually Google that and do their own risk assessment. Um, so for average women, um, 25 to 40, that is our recommendation. And then once you hit 40, um, for average risk patients, a yearly mammogram, uh, an exam by your OBGYN, self-breast awareness, um, and uh, for our high-risk patients, uh, as Dr. Okabe spoke about, um, exam one to two times a year, yearly mammogram, and then potentially an MRI and risk reduction strategies. Thank you. Um, and I think this is a pretty important question for all of our viewers today. Can breast cancer be prevented? Well, it can't really be prevented, um, but we can, re we can reduce our risks, um, such as getting our yearly mammograms, doing our self-breast exams, um, good nutrition, exercise, keeping our uh, weight down to normal, and reduce not smoking and drinking alcohol, which are risk factors as well. Can I, uh, can I just add a little something? Sure, sure. So again, just like Stephanie mentioned, we you know try to assess a patient's risk in computer programs, but um, although we cannot prevent breast cancer for certain women, if we find that they reach a certain level of risk, it may be an option to actually take an anti-estrogen medication for five years. And what studies have shown is that breast cancer risk can be reduced by 50% or better. So that is something called breast cancer chemo prevention. It is not chemotherapy, but it is a way that we can chemically lessen the risk of breast cancer. Correct. And to add to that, you know, you, just to explain the term, it's chemo prevention. It is trying to prevent you from getting chemo for breast cancer. So it is not chemo per se, but you can take a medication 
that decreases your risk for developing breast cancer. So let's say your risk is, uh, I want to say, 6% over the next 10 years that you could develop breast cancer. And the, the, some of the models that are out there to help calculate that risk that Stephanie mentioned, the Tara Cusick, if you get a number, those risks can be reduced by 50% sometimes by taking these medications. And anti-estrogen medication is what you take. What you're trying to do is basically decrease the estrogen exposure for the breast. So over a woman's lifetime, that estrogen is the one that's helping the breast change, divide, develop. But sometimes whatever the division that is happening, if there is a a little change or some difference that happens from the original one, it keeps accumulating. And you can imagine that chain accumulates and accumulates over lifetime can develop in a breast cancer down the line. But if somehow you give the breast tissue a little break from this estrogen exposure, you kind of prevent those uh, changes from accumulating and reaching a peak point where they could develop into a breast cancer. So that's the, the theory behind why or how chemo prevention works in preventing a breast cancer down the line. And yeah, to add to that, if, if a, a woman listening were to get online and do her own tyracusic, basically our threshold is greater than 20% lifetime risk is considered increased or high risk. Um, and, and if your number was in that range, you should contact a breast surgeon or talk to your um, PCP. And then inter, uh, there's a 15 to 20% risk where depending on the patient, um, they might also qualify for some of those um, screening strategies. Great, perfect. Thank you all for, for uh, responding to that question. I think it's very important um, to know about the uh, screening options that are available at prevention measures that people can take for um, lessening their risk. Um, so Stephanie, uh, what are the biggest risk factors for breast cancer? So one of the biggest, which I'm sure Emily will discuss is family history um, or a genetic predisposition. Um, you can have a family history, a strong family history and get genetic testing and the genetic testing be negative, uh, but a strong family history would still be a risk. Um, obviously, if genetic testing is done and you have a BRCA gene abnormality uh, or some other genes that I'm sure Emily will talk about, that would increase your risk. Uh, like as I spoke about um, excessive alcohol use, uh, you know, more than one to two beverages a week, uh, tobacco use, smoking, those all increase uh, our risk for breast cancer. Increased uh, BMI is a risk because estrogen is stored in fat cells. So the more fat we have on us, the increased more our BMI is, um, the higher risk because that estrogen is there and, and, and can fuel the fire, so to speak, if the cancer develops. Um, and then another risk factor that I've noticed pushes people's tyracusic number up is having a child later in life uh, over the age of 25, 26, or not having children at all can increase our risk. Great, thank you very much, uh, Stephanie. I think that's a good segue to talk about uh, genetic counseling with Emily Kaczynski. Um, so Emily, how do you determine um, if someone has a higher risk of developing uh, breast cancer? And can you tell us how genetics uh, plays a part? Yeah, sure. So we know that up to 10%, maybe even 15% of breast cancer is inherited. Um, so certain red flags that I look for when I'm assessing a family history are, first of all, just how much breast cancer there is in the family. So, you know, with a big enough family, a lot of us will have, you know, one or two relatives with, with breast cancer. Um, unfortunately, it's not a rare cancer. Um, but we, when we start seeing two or more relatives on the same side of the family, um, so, you know, grandma, aunt, cousin, mom, um, that does raise suspicion that there might be a genetic link or something in the DNA that's getting passed down, putting people at higher risk. Um, another really big red flag that I look for is being diagnosed at a young age, because uh, most cancer is just accelerated by aging. So when we see cancer in the 30s or 40s, we wonder, you know, we can't blame that on their age. Um, so we wonder, could it be that they were born with a genetic mutation that made them more predisposed? Um, and then another red flag that I look for is the presence of rare cancers. 
Um, so things like ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer, even male breast cancer, which are all very rare cancers in the general population, but have a much higher incidence in our genetic families um, and often will run together with early onset breast cancer. So, so those are the, the major red flags that I look for. And it is really important to try and figure out um, if the breast cancer in the family is maybe more due to shared you know, hormonal factors, like Stephanie was saying, having kids later, um, getting your period young, uh, those sorts of things can cluster in families and cause a family to have that, that family history, but it's not due to a genetic mutation. Um, but it is important to try and figure out if that family history is due to a genetic mutation because um, that risk for breast cancer goes much, much higher um, than would be calculated by those family um, history risk models that were talked about earlier. So it's important to try and um, really clarify that risk and, and genetic testing can be important in, in, in that. Thank you, uh, thanks Emily. Um, could you further delve into genetic testing? Um, I'm curious to know about it personally speaking because several uh, people in my family have had either breast cancer or ovarian cancer. Um, for people like me or you know, just general population um, uh, in general, how, does, how is genetic testing done? Yeah, sure, it's a good question. I think a lot of people think genetic testing is, is more complicated um, as far as how it's done. So actually it's, it's just either a blood test or we can even do saliva testing. So for people that are electing for telehealth consults and it's easier, you know, we can mail a saliva kit right to their home. Um, or if they're in, you know, any way we can, we can draw the blood. Um, so that, that part's simple, it's easy to do. Uh, the lab will look for um, multiple genes related to breast cancer, and, and Stephanie brought this up earlier. So, um, you know, often when, when people ask for genetic testing, they want to be tested for the cancer gene. And, and so there actually isn't just one gene. Um, there are common breast cancer genes like the BRCA genes, BRCA1 and 2. Um, but there's also a dozen other um, cancer genes related to inherited breast and often ovarian cancer. And so we're now regularly uh, testing for those genes as well. Um, so it's, it's important you know, for family members that might be listening that said, oh, I had genetic testing 10 years ago, it was negative. Um, it might be a good idea to talk to their doctors about um, you know, should I go back and have more genetic testing? Because every few years, you know, it, it expands and we add um, additional, additional genes. So the, the process itself is easy to do, but I also would strongly encourage um, meeting with a genetic counselor before you consider any genetic testing. Um, genetic counselors can really break down the benefits of testing, what exactly is going to be tested. Um, there, are, there are some limitations. I think Stephanie mentioned that genetic testing can come back negative, um, but you still remain at very high risk for breast cancer and, and certain interventions you know, may still be recommended. Um, so genetic testing, it, it isn't a crystal ball. You know, it doesn't tell us for sure if someone's going to get cancer or not getting cancer, but it just helps us better understand their risk level and, and whether or not we should you know, recommend additional interventions. Thanks, Emily. Um, I think it's important to, to know that that technology is even available to at least determine the likelihood of, of something uh, coming down the road in, in terms of- Yeah, and I'll, I just, one other thing I think to add that a lot of people I think prohibit them from wanting to learn more about it or come in is that you know most in, insurance companies do cover genetic testing, um, certainly in those that have family history um, it is covered by insurance. So most of my patients, you know, are paying um, zero or, or less than $100. I think that's a myth that's out there that, you know, oh, I want to do it, but it, it's going to cost me, you know, thousands of dollars. And that's, that's simply not true that, you know, thankfully with more labs doing genetic testing, it's more widely available. Um, there, you know, cost usually is not going to be an issue, I'd say for 99% of people that, that want to do testing. That's very, very good to know. Thank you. Thank you for yeah. uh, mentioning that. Uh, so if a patient is found to be at a high risk, what, what should they do? What should be the first step? Yeah, so it's going to depend on, you know, which gene we, we find the mutation in. Like I mentioned, there's different ones. Some are mainly linked to breast cancer. So for, for those patients, um, we start breast um, cancer screening as young as 25, and we start with breast MRI. Um, and then typically at age 30 also and uh, add in an annual mammogram. Um, some patients who have an especially strong family history or maybe lost 
you know, their mom or sister to breast cancer at a young age and now also are found to have that high risk because of their genetics, you know, may decide to have their breasts removed. Um, it's not mandatory, uh, but it, it can be an option to reduce that risk for breast cancer to the greatest extent. Um, and then there may be other cancer types that we would need to address. So they could be at increased risk for ovarian cancer or colon cancer. So um, it's, it's important to fully understand that genetic test is odd and the implications it has. And also, um, now that we've uncovered that risk, the, the goal is to really tell as much of the family as we possibly can. Um, because all of that person's close relatives would have a 50-50 a chance of, of having that genetic mutation. Uh, so it's important to spread the word and, and offer testing to the rest of the family as well. Great, thank you. Thank you, Emily. Uh, at this time, I'd like to welcome our viewers again. If you're just joining us, thanks for tuning in. Uh, we're talking about breast cancer risk factors uh, warning signs, treatment options, and much more. I'm here with breast surgeon, Dr. Atsuko Okabe, uh, medical oncologist, Dr. Shweta Kurian, certified genetic counselor, Emily Kuczynski, and physician assistant, Stephanie Johnson. We have more to talk about, so keep watching, share this broadcast with your friends, give us a like to let us know that you're watching, and um, feel free to ask any questions in the comments below. We're gonna take some time to answer those as well. Um, at this time, I'd like to turn to uh, Dr. Curian. Uh, could you tell us about the high-risk uh, clinic, where it's located, who's treated there, uh, et cetera? Sure. So the high-risk clinic um, is here at Franklin Square uh, at the Weinberg Cancer Center. So we, it is on the first and the third Thursdays, and it is in the later half of the day, so noon and beyond. Uh, patients actually um, are referred to us either from Emily if they have done a genetic testing and found to have a mutation that's high risk for developing breast cancer or mutation that places them at high risk for other cancers or they can be referred to us <clears throat> but if they have been calculated a score uh, and they have a high score for developing breast cancer like Tarakusic or Gale risk um, and uh, these patients because they have a higher risk for developing breast cancer down the line, coming for a discussion about how they can mitigate that risk, decrease the risk. So we can actually move these patients or divide these patients among two. One who don't have a genetic mutation that's driving it, but because of family history or their other history, their risk is high. And in that scenario, we talk about medications to help decrease their risk for developing breast cancer. Sometimes it could be a biopsy of the breast that they've had, which is showing a particular feature under the microscope that tells us that if this particular thing is seen under the microscope, these patients are likely to develop breast cancer down the line. So you, these patients can be placed on anti-estrogen medications and this can decrease their risk for developing breast cancer. On the other hand, you have patients who have an underlying mutation. They are born with this mutation passed on in the family from one generation to the other. That increases their risk for breast cancer or uh, different types of cancer that forms uh, a series or syndrome of cancer. Like if you say BRCA1 mutation, it increases your risk for breast and ovarian or GYN cancer. So these patients not only are, uh, they, we talk to them about what can be done to decrease their risk for breast cancer. They are then um, handed over to the breast surgery team to consider risk reducing procedures like mastectomies where we remove the breast or talk about other medications that can decrease your risk, anti-estrogen medications again. We help them get scheduled to meet with the GYN oncologist because there is a risk for developing ovarian cancer or other GYN cancer. So we can then, they can meet with the GYN oncologist, discuss about when or whether they are interested in other risk-reducing procedures where they remove both the ovaries and the fallopian tubes where the patient has higher risk of developing those type of cancer. Now, people could come with a different mutation, a check two mutation, which increases not just the risk of breast cancer. Here, the risk for breast cancer is there, but not as high for us to say, hey, go remove your breast. But then there are other risks involved. There's a risk for thyroid cancer. There's a risk for kidney cancer. There could be risk for prostate cancer in the family. So then the guidelines are how you help them uh, monitor for those is what we then take care of in the high risk. We'll arrange for them to meet with the endocrinologist or a urologist, arrange for thyroid ultrasounds or ultrasound of the kidneys to kind of monitor them 
over their lifetime. So we identify if the cancer were to develop, we had to try to identify them earlier so we can manage them when the cancer is small. Um, so that's some part of the high-risk clinic that we do. I think a lot of discussion is also about convincing other family members to get tested and trying to tell them, hey, have a discussion with your other family members because if you have a genetic mutation or if you as part of the family have a higher risk, it is very likely other family members are also having higher risk based on that. Great information. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Kurian. It's definitely definitely given me uh, much to think about and uh, possibly need some need to have some family conversations <laughs> when it comes to this. So, so thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Okabe, I'd like to turn to you and talk about uh, breast cancer treatment. So could you could you tell us how breast cancer is treated? So um, breast cancer treatment often is is going to involve not only the breast surgeons, but um, almost always the medical oncologist. And depending on the type of surgery uh, and maybe the findings um, at surgery, uh, radiation oncologist. So just kind of to talk about what are the surgical options, the two main categories of breast cancer surgery are either mastectomy or what we refer to as breast conservation therapy. So breast conservation means um, removing just a portion of the breast, but it's almost always going to be followed by radiation therapy. And um, breast conservation therapy came about in the 1970s when a large clinical trial did show that uh, performing lesser surgery of the breast had same survival and good outcome as a woman having mastectomy. So mastectomy, on the other hand, is where we do remove the breast tissue. Um, and that can be performed with or without breast reconstruction. The breast reconstruction is an option for the woman and they can choose whether to have it or not. Um, these days, for some women, they may even be able to have what's called a nipple sparing mastectomy, where we make an incision on just the bottom part of the breast, you know, the, we call it the inframammary fold. Um, so you're gonna have a less visible scar, but we preserve the natural appearance of the breast by saving the nipple area up. Um, and if the cancer is invasive, meaning it's not just contained in the ducts of the breast, then there is a possibility that the cancer could have gone to the lymph nodes. So with that kind of finding, um, we will also assess the lymph nodes uh, in the underarm, which we call the axillary lymph nodes. Thank you, Dr. Okabe. Uh, I think that was a good segue to my next question, which was going to be, is uh, surgery a standard part of treatment? But it seems like, you know, surgery is, an, is one of the options, but there are, you know, other treatment options available in addition to that, uh, correct? Right. Well, surgery, I would say surgery is not an option. Surgery mm -hmm. is almost always going to be a must, right? Okay. So so if there is um, stage one, two, or three breast cancer, then surgery is always a part of that woman's treatment. Okay. Um, the only exception is that we do um, participate in a lot of uh, clinical trials here at MedStar. And currently we do have a clinical trial that is looking at DCIS. So ductal carcinoma in situ is the type of cancer, it's so early that the cancer cells are still contained in the ducts. And one of the clinical trials that we're doing is trying to assess when a woman has low risk DCIS, do they always have to have surgery or surgery plus radiation and, and that. So um, in that particular case, um, just as part of the clinical trial, there may be some women who will be treated with medication. Um, that we've already talked about, the anti-estrogen medication, along with real close follow-up. Thank you. Um, are there any minimally invasive surgical options for breast cancer? So I would, I would characterize breast conservation, what um, I described earlier as lumpectomy and radiation therapy, is minimally invasive in that we are not removing the entire breast, and um, we're able to preserve the natural appearance of the breast. Um, and then when it comes to lymph nodes, in the years past, we used to always do a bigger lymph node surgery where we removed a pad of fatty tissue from the underarm that we called level one and level two lymph nodes. And back then you may have 
10 to 20 or more lymph nodes removed. Fortunately, again, this is um, uh, kind of an evolution of breast surgery, breast cancer treatment, is that we've been able to do lesser surgeries because the majority of the time there is no involvement of the lymph nodes. So now we do what is called sentinel node biopsy and just remove a few of the lymph nodes from the underarm and we can assess whether there was any spread to the axilla or underarm lymph nodes or not. Okay. Um, and are there any side effects uh, from these surgical treatments? So one of the side effects with doing the axillary or underarm lymph node surgery is you can get what's called lymphedema, which is arm swelling. Um, and we do feel like the more lymph nodes are removed, you're going to have a higher risk of lymphedema. So um, we will monitor four signs of this condition very closely in our office. And one of the things that we do regularly when patients come for follow-up with us is we'll measure the arms because before you can actually visibly see any evidence of swelling or have any symptoms from swelling, the arm measurements will kind of give us an alert that there could be lymphedema. Um, and if it's found, then we have very good uh, lymphedema therapists at MedStar that will help um, you know, start treating it. And the quicker we find it and treat it, um, the better chance we have that we can resolve the condition. Great, that's, that's good information to know. Um, when is, is breast reconstruction um, ever part of the treatment process? Um, so breast reconstruction is um, going to be performed if the woman would like to have it performed when they have their mastectomy. And it can be done immediate, meaning at the same time that the breast surgeon is performing the mastectomy. We can have the plastic surgeon come in um, to do the reconstruction. There are some reconstructive options also that could be uh, part of breast conservation therapy um, when we do just a lumpectomy. Um, some women may have some um, what we call asymmetry or where we know that the size of the breast may not uh, match after the treatment. And in those cases, we would also involve the plastic surgeon and just to mention a little bit about the types of reconstruction, the two main types are um, using implants or the other, and not everybody will qualify for this, but for women who do, they may have an option for what's called a deep flap, where the plastic surgeon will take skin and fatty tissue from the abdomen and bring it up to recreate the breast. All right, um, and how is care coordinated between the different treatment types? So I think this, I, I really feel, is one of the strengths at MedStar is we have a really good uh, close relationship with all the um, breast specialists. So when I say the breast specialists, um, I'm referring to the breast surgeons that work here, the medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, pathologists, and radiologists. So we consider that to be our multidisciplinary team. It involves also genetic counselor, our research nurses, um, and every Thursday, we have a tumor board where we all meet together. We present women who are either newly diagnosed when we want to figure out the best plan possible for that woman's treatment or after surgery, again, to figure out um, what is the best individualized treatment for that patient. So we look at slides, we look at pathology, we look at radiology. And as a group, we're able to make the best treatment choices based on that woman's particular cancer and using national guidelines. Perfect, thank you, uh, Dr. Okabe, for sharing that important information, um, giving me a lot to think about again and, and open my eyes to, to any uh, treatment uh, that's available in case it is needed for either me or my, my loved ones. So thank you very much for that. Uh, at this time, I want to turn to Dr. Kurian. Uh, so as a medical oncologist, uh, what is your, your role in treating breast cancer? So I want to say mine is the most important role, but I cannot say that because I know that's <laughs> not the truth. <laughs> so as Dr. Okabe said, it is a team of people that works to provide the best care. 
And it's so important that each person involved in that team constantly talks and coordinates the care. So when a person comes in with breast cancer, it is looking at, you know, you, you need surgery, you're going to, you may need chemo or you may need endocrine therapy, that is anti-estrogen therapy. You may require radiation, you may require reconstruction. So all these physicians are part of the team. So when a patient comes in, of course, they need surgery. We have to first determine whether the patient needs surgery first or is the tumor big? And if the tumor is big, sometimes they require chemo up front. So my role as a medical oncologist is to treat the cancer medically, whether it is with chemo, whether it is with medications. So those are the things that I provide in terms of uh, breast cancer care. Now, some cancers, not cancers come in different flavors, breast cancer, I mean. So the treatment is very different depending on the type of receptors they have on them. And that is what I meant by flavor. So you choose the type of treatment based on the type of receptors present. So some will require chemo, others will require a combination of chemo immunotherapy, some others will require targeted treatment and chemotherapy, and others will require none of these and just endocrine therapy or anti-estrogen therapy. So that is determined based on what type of uh, uh, cancer it is, what type of receptor it harbors. And once we determine that the patient has all these things that are required, surgery comes in, it could come before or afterwards, and it, the patient may require radiation. Um, so as I said, it's a multidisciplinary approach. And my role is mainly with chemotherapy or endocrine therapy. All right. And uh, Dr. Okabe alluded to this uh, a little bit earlier, but Dr. Kurian, could you uh, share any other information about clinical trials that are available for breast cancer? Of course. And I think as, as being a physician, learning about anything, one thing we always strive for is learning anything new about whatever we are treating. So clinical trial helps us understand what more can be done for a disease than what we are already doing. There are several trials we have available which are looking at patients with early stage disease or late stage disease. And they are designed to either identify newer treatments that can be used or newer procedures or um, radiation oncology techniques that we can use for patients, whether we could decrease the amount of procedures or radiation we're doing for patients. So uh, currently there's a trial which is looking at early stage breast cancers where we are trying to see if there are some patients where we can safely avoid radiation. There are clinical trials looking at using a different type of medication up front for HER2 positive breast cancers. There are trials for patients who have metastatic breast cancer or stage four breast cancer where we are trying to see if there is a newer treatment that works better than the already established treatments. There are clinical trials that were actually started at COVID times, basically to see if certain treatments could actually be safely administered at home with a nurse monitoring them. So many types of trials available. That's awesome. That's good to hear that no matter, you know, what type of flavor or, or type of breast cancer you may have, um, it's good to know that there's, you know, research being done. There's, you know, it's all, things are changing. And, you know, as things evolve, there's new information that could possibly arise. So it's good to know that you guys are, you know, you have your fingers on the pulse of, you know, what's happening um, in terms of breast cancer. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kirian. Um, so as we, we close, um, I'd like to uh, bring the panel back um, together again um, and, and ask what message you have for our viewers today. So Dr. Okabe, I'll start with you. Um, so the key message that I would like to make is how important it is to catch breast cancer early. And we talked about screening, the importance of breast screening because mammograms are going to detect breast cancer way before um, it is ever felt. But that being said, not to forget doing your breast self exams. In a rare instance, women will identify a breast mass that didn't show up well on mammogram. So early, uh, early detection is key. And the reason for that is because that allows the woman to have the um, most options of treatment. Can they have breast conservation therapy where they can save the breast and just remove a portion of it uh, versus mastectomy? And most importantly, have the best chance for cure. 
um, women diagnosed with stage one or stage two breast cancer have an excellent prognosis. And um, just as a closing statement, I just want to say in the U.S., every time I check on the American College, I mean, uh, American Cancer Society site, there are more and more breast cancer survivor uh, women in this country. And uh, when I looked it up just before our um, live YouTube today, <laughs> the um, number of breast cancer survivors in the U.S. is 3.1 million. That's a lot. It gives me hope. Um, so thank you very much, Dr. Okabe, for sharing that. And thanks again for your time as well. Um, I'll turn it over to Dr. Kurian as we close. As Dr. Okabe said, I will also stress on the same thing. Screening, screening, screening. I think it is very important to find things early because that gives the best chance for cure. A lot of women shy away from doing mammograms because they, it's, it gets in the way of things. You know, the recommendations are to start at age 40. Who wants to do a mammogram at age 40? But it is very, very important. It is, you, you could say it's very painful or this, or there could be a lot of excuses for not doing it, but it saves lives. And it extends, you could live when a small tumor is just removed and gone, there is chance for cure, for it never coming back. So always do whatever is needed to prevent one, always do whatever is needed to find them early. So take care of yourself, check your breasts regularly, know how they feel, manage a healthy diet, exercise regularly, cut down alcohol, and do your mammograms. Very important. I gotta have to just chime in really quick and and just echo what you you guys are saying. I did a self exam a couple of years back, and I you know found something that wasn't you know what I usually had found before. You know felt unusual. Called my doctor right away. She referred me to a breast cancer specialist and had a preventative you know mammogram. And thankfully, it you know no cancer was found. So I got to you know to the, to those out there, uh, our viewers out there today watching, you know. Those self exams are very important. Those routine screenings are important. So, you know, be proactive about your health. It's, it's key um, and it could, you know, definitely extend and save your life. So thank you. Thank you both doctors for, for sharing that important message. Um, I'll turn to uh, Emily at this time. Uh, thank you. I think from my perspective and my, my lens, the message I'd wanna send home to everyone today is just to try to learn as much about your family history as you can. Because um, as we talked about today, um, family history of breast cancer can really impact um, your risk to develop breast cancer. So try to learn, you know, who in your family may have had cancer, including breast cancer, um, how old they were when they were diagnosed, because remember diagnosed at young is, makes us more concerned that something genetic can go on. And, and just share that information with the family. I think the greatest gift that you can give to your children and other family members is just um, a record of that, of that family history and that health record, and not just with cancer, but just other, you know, other conditions that may, may run in the family. Um, it can be scary to hear that you are at higher risk and you may not wanna make that, that appointment or that phone call to learn, you know, once you do hear some family members with breast cancer. Um, but, a lot of my patients are, you know, after that initial shock of hearing, yeah, it, it is genetic, it is in my family, um, are very grateful to know. Um, they say that that knowledge is really power. So instead of just, you know, waiting for it to happen to them, they feel like they're in control um, of that situation a bit more and they can, you know, do those early screenings that we talked about, even consider the preventative options and maybe even, you know, break that, that cycle of cancer in the family. Um, so I would just leave with, you know, knowledge is power and, you know, please reach out um, if you feel like you may have that higher risk because of your family history. Thanks, Emily. Yes, knowledge is definitely power. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I'll turn over to Stephanie. So I'm going to just reiterate what Dr. Kerry and Dr. Akabe said, screening is so important. Uh, so definitely the self-breast exams, the mammogram. Uh, as a, uh, a breast cancer survivor and someone that was high risk and didn't know she was high risk, I would really stress, I think in medicine, things always change. And I've noticed over probably the last five years, we are risk stratifying more women at a younger age. Um, and 
so I would, from my lens, both as a survivor and a PA, I would recommend that you stratify yourself. Don't assume because you're 40 with no family history that you're a low risk. There, we are now learning there are other risks. And without doing that risk stratification, you don't know that you're high risk. And that high risk status can um, lead to um, other testing options that could there again, like Dr. Kirian said, find that cancer at such an early stage that you will be a survivor. Um, so that's my lens. Uh, and I agree with Emily, um, knowledge is power. Don't be scared of it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, that, that's all the time that we have for today. Thank you all to our panel, uh, Dr. Atsuko Okabe, Dr. Shweta Kurian, Emily Kuczynski and Stephanie Johnson. Thank you so much for joining us today and taking out the time to share your expertise. Um, and many thanks to our viewers for tuning in um, and being present with us. I really hope that you got a lot of important information out of it. Uh, if, you're in, in, if you're interested in learning more or if you'd like to schedule an appointment, uh, please call us at 443-777-7411. We're gonna place that uh, information in the comments as well. So take a look at that when you have time. Uh, thanks again for joining and have a wonderful day.